Hey, good morning, ladies and germs, and welcome to Grab Back Season 4, Episode 1. As you can tell, I'm relaxed. I hope you can tell that. I mean, I'm not all dressed up, that kind of thing. It's cold out. Today is uh, February 10th that I'm recording this. It's Joy's birthday. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we've had uh, snow and this is snow week. If you can think back to when you see this and you can think back. Yeah, this is snow week here in our area. So um, I hope that you're warm and I hope that uh, you're able to gain some knowledge from the time that we're going to spend together. If you would, first of all, be kind enough to click on the button uh, below to register your attendance with us. And as you can tell, I'm downstairs uh, in our kitchen in the house. I had to get out of that cave of my office upstairs. Matt always says we should just have a solid background behind us, but I have no sheet that I can put up behind me. So there you go. If you get bored, you know, you can look over there, you can look over there, what, whatever. Okay. Now, what I want to talk about, you know, we, during the last season, you know, those episodes, we talked about John chapter 11 and uh, Jesus being the resurrection of life, the, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. I want to talk about John chapter 6. And we're going to do that beginning with our next lesson. But in this lesson, I want to bring out a subject that I probably should have mentioned even long ago. Um, but I want to talk about context. Context. It's a Bible study tool. And uh, you know, along the way, I want to give you information about the Bible, but hopefully give you some help in studying the scripture on your own so that you're not always expecting a quote professional you know to have to tell you um, you can study the bible on your own that was that's one of the great things about the scripture so let me give a definition for context um, context is defined as the parts of something written or spoken that immediately precede and follow a word or passage and clarify its meaning. A, the parts of something written or spoken that immediately precede and follow a word or passage and clarify its meaning. Now, I want to broaden that definition to the parts of something written or spoken that surround a word or a passage and clarify its meaning. Um, Immediate is a good word for context, <clears throat> and at times, immediate circumstances should be checked first. But when it comes to writings of yesterday or even yesteryear, for instance, the scripture that we're studying, you know, a broader view of surrounding circumstances is expedient. Not just what's immediate, but what surrounded that passage and that writing uh, you know, a bigger, broader view and that may take in history and uh, social context and that type of thing. So, that, for example, our Declaration of Independence, why was it written? Well, to discover the reason why it was written, one would have to do some research and, and study events, attitudes, governments, etc., surrounding that era in the 1700s or even earlier. So it's not just what happened immediately before and after, it was what happened surrounding that event, what led up to it and uh, what brought it about. So that, that's context, putting it in a broad framework to help our understanding. It, it's that way with Bible study. With the Bible being a book that covers thousands of years from creation to the late first century, the context surrounding certain passages of Scripture provide insight. People have used and can use Bible verses out of context to prove a lot of different things. For instance, this is just kind of fun, but someone took 
a bunch of Bible verses out of context, and they compiled them this way. Once upon a time, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Now, you may recognize that as being from the Good Samaritan parable that Jesus told. But the guy goes on, and the thorns grew up and choked that man. And he went on and met the queen of Sheba, and she gave that man a thousand talents of gold and silver and hundred changes of raiment. And he got in his chariot and drove furiously. And as he was driving under a big tree, his hair got caught on a limb and left him hanging there. That, of course, is the story of Absalom. And he hung there many days and many nights, and ravens brought him food to eat and water to drink. And one night, while he was hanging there asleep, his wife Delilah came along and cut off his hair. And he dropped and fell on stony ground, and it began to rain. And it rained 40 days and 40 nights, and he hid himself in a cave. And he went out and met a man and said, come and take supper with me in my cave. But the man answered, I cannot, for I have married a wife. And the cave dweller went out into the highways and byways and compelled people to come in. And he went to Jericho, and he saw Queen Jezebel sitting high up in a window. And when she saw him, she laughed, and he said, throw her down. He said, throw her down again. And they threw her down 70 times seven. And the fragments, they picked up 12 baskets full. And now what I want to know is, whose wife will she be on the day of resurrection? All of those are portions of scripture that are just yanked out of context and slammed together to perform or to present this uh, joke. You know, it makes us laugh. But it's not a joking matter when people take scripture out of context. You know, one verse that's often taken out of context is Philippians 4.13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Or I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And a lot of times people use that verse like, you know, just to kind of boost somebody's ego. It's self-actualization or self-confidence, uh, some kind of mantra you know, to, to, to boost your confidence. But really, can anyone do all things? You know, can I win Super Bowls like Tom Brady? <laughs> no. Can I lose them like Patrick Mahomes? No, I can't even do that. Can I lose them like the Pittsburgh Steelers? Well, yeah, I could probably do that. I'd just um, play hard and then quit. But, oh, anyway, you know, the, the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, when you look at the context of it, the Apostle Paul is talking about contentment. And he says, there are times that I have plenty and there are times I've been in want, but, but I can do everything. I can have this contentment through Christ who strengthens me. And so the verses need to be understood in context. For instance, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Now, the, <coughs> you know, when I heard that verse, and oftentimes when we hear it, it's put in the context of heaven. And you hear it a lot at, at sermon, or uh, at sermons, at, during funeral sermons. You know, people talk about heaven. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has planned for them. And, and that's okay. It's true that heaven is more than we can imagine. But in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that verse is not about heaven. It's about God's revelation of his wisdom and his plan for man's salvation in Jesus. In other words, it's not a verse about what awaits us in the future in heaven. It's a verse about what God has given us now in Christ. Listen to that verse in context. We declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden, and that God has destined for our glory before time began. In other words, the mystery of God's plan that was established before time began Paul is saying, we are declaring that wisdom of God to you right now. None of the rulers of this age understood it, 
For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In other words, they didn't understand what God was doing. <clears throat> and so when Jesus came, they ended up crucifying him. That's when he says, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. So God has revealed his plan. God has brought to light his mystery that was established before the foundation of the world. God has made it known to us and revealed it to us through his spirit. God has displayed his wisdom. In fact, God has had his wisdom spoken through the person of Jesus. So you find out that the wisdom of God is really defined as Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Uh, if we broaden our context from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and add in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in verses 24 and 30, we find out that the wisdom of God is actually Jesus. And so God sending Christ as Savior and Jesus speaking the message of salvation to us is that which is, according to Paul's words, beyond human comprehension. So you don't really understand what that verse is about. And you can easily be misled to thinking that it's a verse about heaven when it's taken out of context in 1 Corinthians. I hope that didn't confuse you, but I hope that helps you understand how valuable context is. So a general beginning framework for context in Bible study is the context of the Testament in which your passage is found. Is it Old Testament or New Testament? Sometimes that's referred to as context of covenant. Is it in the Old Covenant or the New Covenant? Is the statement, the teaching, the doctrine part of the Old Covenant or the New Covenant under the covenant of law or the covenant of grace? So that offers us a broad context for uh, beginning a study of a certain portion of scripture. Now, if you say, well, my verse is found in the New Testament. So in the context of the Testament, we can narrow down to the context, or we can narrow the context down even further by asking questions like, who is the author? To whom was the information written? What was the purpose of the writing? Consideration should also be given to cultural conditions and beliefs. For instance, was the writing addressed to a Jewish audience or a Greek audience? Here, look at these verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul wrote, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. And it is the same as having her head shaved. Later, he writes, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? So somebody reads that could just think, oh man, a woman should always have her head covered when she prays. Should a woman never pray with her head uncovered? Or... Is that a cultural context? Is that a cultural norm of that time that does not apply for our time? See, we determine how to interpret these verses by the context. The context of one thing just has Paul saying, judge for yourselves. In other words, this is not a God-given order. This is something that you can decide for yourself. But we also judge the context by the culture that was surrounding Paul's statement. So you begin context with the big picture. Is it Old Testament? Is it New Testament? Okay, if it's New Testament, 
then let's talk about why it was written, to whom it was written, what was the cultural context for the passage that we are studying. So let me make an example of context application with the scripture that we studied previously in John chapter 11. Okay, so we look at the wider context. We are using the Bible. That's as broad as we can get there. Now we narrow it down. We are in the New Testament. We narrow it down even further to the Gospels, one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We narrow it even further to the Gospel of John. You see how we keep narrowing the context down to get a more refined understanding of the chapter that we, are, that we had just studied. Now, we don't realize it, but we are also thinking context when we think about and picture in our minds a man teaching as he walked along with disciples following him. That mode of transportation influences our thinking. We're in Bible times, we're in the New Testament, we're in the Gospel of John, and we talk about a man following along who's teaching and he has disciples following him and he is walking. And in our minds, we begin to form a context around that scripture. It's a contextual understanding that our mind brings to the scripture. When we talk about Jesus traveling from Jericho to Bethany, which we did, we had to think about context, things like distance, but not just distance, also elevation, because Jericho is below sea level while Jerusalem is up on the top of a mountain. And it's an extreme drop in elevation from Jerusalem to uh, Jericho. Now, Bethany was two miles out of Jerusalem. So when Jesus, when we talked about Jesus going from Jericho to Bethany, we had to talk about the fact that he was walking, but he was also walking uphill. And it was hot. <laughs> so, you know, we're talking about mode of transportation, elevation, the times that were necessary for travel. Those are all contextual things that influence our understanding of the scripture. Jesus arrives at a funeral. Well, in the context of that time, we have to ask, what were funerals and burials like in Lazarus's day? See, that is all contextual thinking that informs and colors our understanding of the scripture. So the bottom line is this, for the best understanding of scripture, if we are going to be diligent students of the scripture, then we need to grasp context, not just the things that are immediately before and after the statement we read, but we need to have a grasp of a broad, broad context surrounding the scripture that we're studying. We've been studying John chapter 11. And we're going to um, back up in John's gospel for the next uh, grab bag episodes that we're going to study. Because I'd like for us to dive into, well, dive into, well, you know, you, you get it. I'd like for us to study John chapter six. But before we do, how about if we consider a couple aspects of context? For instance, we could ask ourselves, who was John? Who was this guy who was writing this gospel? Because it would help us to understand the writing. Well, what do we know of John? Very simple. He was a disciple of Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus with his brother, James. John was the longest surviving apostle and the author of the Bible book, Revelation. Now, remember, it's just one. A lot of people say Revelations. It's just one. 
revelation. If we're going to be accurate students, let's let's make sure that we uh, say things accurately. So as Revelation, John wrote the book of Revelation, as well as being the author of the letters or what we call epistles. Some people said, what's an epistle? He said, that's the wife of an apostle. <laughs> but epistle is just another name for a letter. So John wrote the letters that we call 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now, John and his brother James used to be known as the Sons of Thunder, which gives you a clue to their temperament. That's, and like, and when you look at Luke 9, 54, <clears throat> when the disciples in James and John saw that the Samaritans were rejecting Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem, they asked Jesus, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? I mean, they, they were hot. They were, they had bad tempers. They were also the two who asked Jesus to sit in positions of power in his kingdom. These guys were go-getters, get, get what you can for yourself, and, and kick everybody out of the way if they get in your way. But yet Jesus did such a makeover in John's life that he was later tagged the apostle of love. And love is a theme and a word that's often written about in John's writings. Of course, most famous is John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Uh, interestingly enough, John often refers to himself in the third person as the apostle whom Jesus loved. So that kind of gives you an idea that when John writes, he's going to write with passion and compassion. And John's going to write about love and, and caring for people. And so that gives you a bit of context for his writing. A second contextual question to ask is, why did John write his gospel? You know, and John gives us that answer when in John, in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, we read, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. See, a sign was a confirming miracle. That is one that attested to Jesus being the Son of God. And there are seven major miracles that John mentions in his gospel, beginning with Jesus changing water into award-winning caliber wine in chapter 2, and ending with a miraculous catch of fish in chapter 21. Mark writes about 21 different miracles that Jesus performed, but John chose seven. And that's another question to consider sometimes. Why just those seven? What was so special about those seven that, that John chose those as giving testimony and being enough to give testimony to Jesus being the Son of God? Remember what we just read? Many other signs in the presence of his disciples Jesus did which are not recorded in this book. John is telling you that there were all kind of other miracles and signs. And like I said, Mark mentions 21 of them. And John says, they, but they're not recorded in this book. But I have chosen these. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. An important aspect of the context of John's gospel is that his gospel was written to a Greek or a non-Jewish audience that had been influenced by a false religious teaching that said spirit and matter could not join. So one purpose of John's writing was to prove the fleshly reality of the Son of God. You see, Gnosticism believed that flesh and spirit could not conjoin. And so you can see how that would be um, an apostasy 
to Christians, but you can see also how Christian belief would be an apostasy, apostasy to Gnostics, because they believe that the Son of God, that God's, God himself became flesh. Well, how does that happen if flesh and spirit cannot conjoin? And that is one of the purposes of John's writing. He not only wrote to share miracles to convince people that Jesus was the Son of God, he also wrote to inform people that God did indeed come in the flesh. And that is why, for instance, in John chapter 1, we read, and the Word, which was John's name for Jesus, the Word became flesh. And he lived among us, and we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. John is saying, spirit and flesh did join together in Jesus. God became flesh, and he lived among us, and we beheld, we saw with our own eyes. And some of the things that we saw are these miracles that John says attest to Jesus' divinity. And John also, I'm trying to save time here, but I don't want to take a rabbit trail, but, you know, John also, you think about the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus when he has breakfast on shore with the disciples. Think about where John writes that after the resurrection, Jesus showed up and he offered his hands for the disciples to touch. He said to Thomas, go ahead, you know, touch the nail scars in my hand. Excuse me, put your hand in my side. In other words, I'm not a ghost. I'm real flesh and blood. The resurrection is a reality. And so uh, the, John is wanting, is writing to non-Jewish believers who have been misled by this false philosophy. And so if they believe that philosophy, they would think that Jesus would not be the Son of God. And John is writing and saying, no, 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 no. The miracles prove that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh. And after his resurrection, it was not a ghost. It was not something mystical and something just totally spiritual, but Jesus rose and was in the flesh even after the resurrection. So John has more than one purpose in the writing of his gospel. And if we understand that, that gives us a mental context for looking at the scripture. We can look at the scripture in the, in, the, in the way that John meant for it to be understood. Okay, I, I, like I said, we don't have any interaction, so I'm hoping that you're understanding that. You know, perhaps John was inspired to adopt the purpose of his gospel from a statement Jesus expressed during a confrontation with religious authorities in the temple. In John 10, we read, they came to a festival of dedication at Jerusalem. Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. And again, there John is providing context for this verse. It was winter, it was in the temple, it was in the colonnade. And the Jews who were there gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you were the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe me. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. You see, the works testify about me, and that's it's John's purpose. Maybe he grabbed that from Jesus. I'm telling you these because they testify to who Jesus is. Okay. Well, I'm trying to stay within a time frame, so let me give a final closing statement here. John and the Bible writers, teachers, preachers believed what we should believe today. 
And that is that God's word has the power to convict and transform through the work of the Holy Spirit. John did not have to be on site in order for the gospel message to bring people to faith. He could write his gospel and trust that that message, that the Spirit working through that gospel would bring people to conviction and bring them to faith. Well, it's still the same today for you and me. You know, we, we present the gospel, but we don't present the gospel in our own strength and in our own power and trust that we can bring people to conviction and bring people to faith. You know, personally, as a preacher, I want to present the gospel in the best light possible and make it as interesting and captivating as I can within my abilities. Not because I believe I can twist people's spiritual arms and force them to believe, but because I want people to not be turned off to God, not be turned off to his word. I want instead the present the gospel the best way that I can in order that people can be attracted by the gospel and attracted to the gospel. At which point then God and the Holy Spirit through the word can convict them of sin and draw them to faith. The word, the, you know, think about Romans 1.18. Paul says, that the uh, he's not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who will believe. The gospel is the power of God that brings people to salvation. And so you and I, you know, we live like Jesus because we don't want to be a stumbling block to anyone. We want to build bridges. We want to open up opportunities to be able to present the gospel. And we study the word of God so that when the opportunities open up, we know what to say. We know what scripture to use. And we present it the best that we possibly can. Not because it depends on us, but because it all depends on God. It depends on the Holy Spirit. And we don't want people to be turned off to the word of God. We don't want people to be turned off from God. We want, the, we want to present the gospel in the best way, in the best light that we possibly can so that people then hear the word of God and they are brought to conviction and faith. It's not just people like me, but it's people like you. You know, we need to understand the scripture as best as we can, to present it as best that we can, so that God and the Holy Spirit can work through the gospel that we share. Okay, the, now we, we started talking about context, and I, I hope that... Um, you know, rewind, watch over again, and understand uh, what we're talking about when it comes to context. But we want to understand the scripture in context and present it as best as we can, because we want to transfer that to our context, the context of our lives, the context of our families and our associates, in order that God and the Spirit can work through the scripture through us. Okay, so here's your homework. I would like for you before next week to read John chapter six. In fact, it'd be great if you would read it each day in order to become familiar with it. And when you're reading it, look for contextual clues in your reading, okay? Thanks for your patience. Thanks for being with me today. And I look forward to sharing episode two next week as we begin our study of John chapter six. Ciao.